Welcome to the Troy Public Library. My name is Maggie Forrest and I'm one of the reference librarians. I want to take this time out to thank the Friends of the Library for supporting our program tonight. Okay, um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Vic and Rick uh, with Get Out and Bird with the Bird Guys. As you know, they've done many programs for the Troy Public Library and this is a very exciting time in Michigan. Everything's greening up and the birds are coming back. In fact, yesterday I saw my first hummingbird, which was really exciting. So let's join the bird guys, Rick Forrest and Victor for an evening of photos, stories from their 45 years of birding together. They'll share migration, uh, identification, feeding tips and great birding spots. So here they are, Rick and Vic. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you everybody for, for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, we uh, would never give up an opportunity to talk about birds. Uh, boy, you said 45 years and it goes back at least that far. I was uh, taking a, a graduate class in ornithology, as a matter of fact, on Beaver Island where Central had a station. And Vic and another friend came up to see me up there and we did a little birding. And I think that must have hooked us on that weekend. And We've been birding together ever since. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a retired Rochester science teacher, but I've never lost my love of birding. And in recent years, I've been teaching science for elementary teachers over at Oakland University. Vic? Well, good, afternoon. good evening, everybody. And thank you for participating in tonight's webinar. And thanks for the introduction, Rick. Yeah, uh, we go back a long ways. We've been friends ever since junior high. And um, Rick really gave you the story on how we got started on this. And it's really become kind of a, um, an annual uh, or twice annual event. We'll get out in the um, spring and in the fall. And, you know, over the years, it, it, we've just found different ways to get out and enjoy uh, nature around us and, and birding in particular. Uh, I can remember when I was more active and playing golf, uh, it gave me a great opportunity to see a lot of birds in the wild. And it's just something that you can get out and do. And it's great to do with friends. And it's just a wonderful activity and you learn an awful lot. So hopefully tonight in our presentation, you're gonna be able to learn a little bit and maybe you can grab a couple of friends and go out and go birdie. And we'll start with this uh, red-headed woodpecker that um, <laughs> we were camping at Higgins Lake last summer. And um, you know, some campers, we're talking about a woodpecker nest. I go, where's that? And, and they just kind of pointed down the trail and I found it. And, uh, and this is, this is the, uh, the tenant. So to get started in birding, you're gonna need a pair of binoculars, a couple of shady characters there. <laughs> and why is this not changing? There we go. Oops. I think we skipped a slide. Let's go back. All right, here we go. Um, and binoculars, uh, you know, we put in the handout, we have um, some, some information about binoculars, but basically there's two styles out there. There's what are called roof prism on the left here, which are probably more popular with birders because of their compact size. And then the traditional, I guess, uh, older style coral prism binoculars that you see on the right. They're kind of rated by numbers that say something like eight, four, eight by 42. Uh, they could be seven by 50 or whatever, but that first number is the magnification. And then the second number is the objective lens diameter. So the bigger that number is for the second number, the more light they're gonna let through. And the bigger the number is for the first number, the, the more powerful the magnification. Eight, eight or 10 is good for birders. When you get up to like 12, it gets to be a little bit shaky. It's hard to keep your binoculars steady. Right. There you go. Tried and true, the Peterson Field Guide to the Birds. Always a great uh, sidearm to have with you when you're out in the field. Although nowadays, uh, there are many good apps available for uh, smartphones. And on the right, you can see the iBird Guide to Birding uh, Pro Edition. Uh, it's a wonderful program. I've been using it for a number of years and I think Rick has too and it affords you a lot of flexibility. It has bird calls, range maps, uh, even a built-in journal where you can record your sightings. So 
got plenty of good choices here for uh, education. And, and there's choices. We listed some of these in the handout, but uh, and there's actually a couple of pretty good free ones as well. And they're in the handout as well. So, of course, you're going to need an interest in birds. Now, we, we kind of... <laughs> We were wondering what shot to put here. This is actually a shot from Crane Fest where there was quite a few people looking out at a number of birds that were out in the field. But uh, we've got shots, that, you know, we've seen crowds, very big crowds at uh, McGee Marsh, uh, you know, everybody with their, you know, binoculars and cameras and so on out there. So an interest in birds. Now let's talk about what you should look for. I mean, the first one, somebody, you know, asked me about a bird they'll describe its appearance, which is a good place to start, but there are a lot of things to look for besides just the appearance. Now, if you see a bird like this, this is a, there's its song. It's hard to mistake when you see a bird of this uh, color, but this is a scarlet tanager. Quite flamboyant. song has been described as a robin with a sore throat. Then you're going to want to make a, a, a look of where you saw the bird. The habitat is very important. Now, there's a lot of birds that, um, you, know, you know, we were talking about the marsh wren the other day. There's a lot of marsh, there's a lot of wrens, but if you see it in the marsh and cattails, you know, it's a good chance that it's, that it's a marsh wren. This, this is, let's listen to this bird. <laughs> this is the Virginia rail, which is a marshland bird or a wetland habitat bird. Um, there are some birds that are stocky like this that you might see in a more upland uh, environment, like a woodcock or something. But you see it in the marsh, it's a good, good chance it's definitely a marshland bird. And the comparative size would be pretty close to maybe a chicken. And you also want to be able to relate the bird that you saw, if you're describing it to somebody, to a common bird that most people know. So um, birders tend to use, well, was it a crow-sized bird or a robin-sized bird or a sparrow-sized bird? Um, those are three very commonly used size references for if you see a bird and you're describing it to somebody else. And then, of course, some birds are just very distinctive in their sound, if you happen to hear it. This is a Sora, and you do hear them more than you see them because they're, they're pretty much an elusive bird. Um, but when you hear them, it's just not mistakable. So, you know, you can describe that song to somebody, which is kind of hard. But uh, it's uh, definitely helps in identification. Again, another marsh bird. Okay, here's a good one. Uh, sometimes you want to look for the characteristics of the bird. Yeah, pretty sure. Watch the tail. See it pumping its tail? Well, let me go back and say one more thing about that. Um, so a palm warbler, one of the first warblers to arrive, actually saw one uh, here yesterday. Um, that tail pumping is a giveaway. I mean, that's the, one of the few, you know, there's a few birds that pump their tail like that, but in a warbler, that's kind of a giveaway for that, that particular um, bird. And then lastly, you want to look at the, you know, the time of year that you're seeing the bird. And then if you've got a, a field guide or an app that has the range map, you want to check to make sure that that's kind of a likely thing. Now you can see birds out of their range, but you start with what's more likely in terms of you, you trying to identify the bird. So this particular one is a um, pine warbler and it's an early arrival. This was in April, uh, back a few years back, 2015 but in Northern Michigan in April. When we look at the range map and it's, uh, you know, it is uh, 
breeding grounds in the northern uh, part of the state. Again, the um, pine warbler is an early arrival. It will usually come ahead of uh, some of your other wood warblers. You might hear it. Uh, we were on vacation, we were on a, a, a few years back now, we were on a cruise and I never go anywhere without my binoculars and camera and saw this bird and uh, gee, it looked like a, you know, certainly one of the warblers like we might see up here, but in, in kind of checking it out a little bit further, um, I came to call it a prairie warbler and we look at the prairie warbler range and we were there kind of late winter and it, then it made sense that the, the prairie warbler, this is a, a likely bird. So again, what helped me identify it was the range map and the time of year that I saw it. There we go. Here we have a, uh, uh, what we call migration route. Really, this is more like a, a road map to see where you can find birds during migration. Uh, we're lucky in Michigan because we live right along what they call the Mississippi Valley Flyway. And if you look out to the east, there's a couple of flyways that run along the Atlantic coast, one that goes straight down through Florida, and the other one kind of curves around through the islands in the Caribbean. And then through the central plain states, they have the same thing, and again, on the west coast. During migration seasons, you will find that birds generally travel these routes to get where they need to go. And being in those routes is a great way to make sure that you see some of these birds. So we're gonna share some of our favorite spots and a lot of them are right along, you see part of the Mississippi Flyway kind of veers off and goes up the uh, east coast of Michigan. And so a lot of our favorite spots are right in that, uh, right in that belt there. A few years ago, we always, one of our favorite spots to go was uh, in Oak Harbor, Ohio, where they host a, an event called the Biggest Week in American Birding. And, you know, we went there early on when it wasn't too crowded, but this got very, very popular very quickly. And it was the best way I can describe it in going to McGee Marsh, which was down in this Oak Harbor area, um, was kind of like shopping on Black Friday. I mean, <laughs> it was very crowded. Uh, but it was an excellent birding place because you can see the birds would pile up on the southern shore of Lake Erie before they kind of crossed in that flyway route that we just shared with you. It's crazy there. So we'll share a few pictures from um, the biggest week in American birding. A lot of your warblers have this kind of a weaker call. I can hear this is a, a Cape May warbler. This one. It's a black burnian warbler. It's birding with my brother to go and he goes, hey, what's that warbler that looks like custom flames on a hot rod from the 1960s, you know, flame decals, flame graphics on the side, you know. <laughs> and these birds, you know, it's not hard to imagine how they got their name. Chestnut sided warbler. That's the nice thing about warblers. The, the coloration on the birds is so distinct that once you're able to train yourself to see these smaller birds, they're pretty easy to identify. And once you get to know the calls, it really helps a lot. So here's another place that we like to go. Although during COVID, it's been almost impossible to get there. And that's Point Pelee National Park in Leamington, Ontario. And as you can see from the previous slide that we showed where Oak Harbor was on the north shore of Lake Erie, this is on the south shore of Lake Erie. 
So when those birds come across the lake and they've stopped at either Pelee Island or, you know, um, uh, Perry's Monument or Kelly's Island and through there, this is the first landfall that they see. And the birds are generally very tired and very hungry. And they're uh, mostly low on the ground when they come across to feed and to rest. And it's an excellent spot to see birds up close. This was a warbler uh, from Point Pelee last time. Well, maybe it's probably about five or six or seven years old now. But uh, so we, have, we haven't been to Point Pelee in a few years, but. Now the old field guys would always have words to describe the sound. You know, now you can just look in your app and play the sound on your phone. But this was to zip, to zip, to zip, z, 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 you know, and, and, you, and Peterson guides were famous for this, always trying to put words to the sound of the bird. This is a Nashville warbler. Distinctive gray head and white eye ring. In recent years, our, one of our favorite spots, in fact, we're going there, what, a week from Saturday? Yes, sir. Uh, Tawas Point. And they do have a birding festival there as well. But this one... Hasn't caught on like McGee Marsh yet. It's, hate to say it, but best kept secret because it's not super crowded and the birding is excellent. Well, not so much anymore. You just let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's a few shots from uh, Talos. Can't mistake that call. Kind of a raspy call, it's a black-throated blue warbler. And he's got a close relative, not colored like him, but well, patterned like him. Yeah. And that's this one. Listen to his call. Very similar tone. And this one's called the black-throated green warbler. Now this is a, a this is a male. The female of this particular bird has kind of a yellow pattern uh, instead of like a bright orange pattern. Here's the it's American Red Start. Let's listen to its call. Whoops, wait a minute. I guess I. There we go. And again, that's a loud call when you're in the field and you hear. A lot of the warblers have the weaker calls, but some of them are very loud and easy to spot by because of that loud call or easy to find. Now I'll tell you the story about this bird. Uh, maybe some of you know what this bird is. Um, we don't we don't see this one often because this is actually a, a fairly rare bird. Let's listen to it first. I was at Taos, this was probably maybe 2015. I heard this sound and somebody next to me goes, and I wasn't sure what the sound was because I don't see these often, but somebody next to me goes, well, that's a Kirtland Warbler. I go, really? You know, if you don't know the story of the Kirtland Warbler back uh, in the seventies, they were so rare. It was said that you could take the world population of Kirtland Warblers and put them in a grocery sack and it would be about half full. <laughs> and so now they've come back a little bit better. They've been managing them. They have a very specific niche. They nest in young jack pines. It's what they're, you know, it's got to be younger jack pines. So they, they manage their nesting area where they actually burn a stand of more mature jack pines, let their cones open and repopulate, you know, the stand of jack pines. Um, but they're, 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 you know, there's a lot more of them now than there was 40 years ago. And uh, to get this shot, I mean, you're, you're generally not supposed to play sounds off of your um, birding app. It's considered not ethical for birders, but somebody next to me did. <laughs> and the bird came in pretty close, so I got this shot. Kirtland's Warbler. Now, the interesting thing about the Kirtlands is, though, uh, it, prior to the last couple of years, it's only known breeding grounds were here in the state of Michigan, up around Mayo. Uh, I guess in the last two years, they have had records of breeding pairs in Wisconsin, 
but I haven't heard much more about that. So, as I said, they're still pretty uncommon. It's uh, pretty pretty much a treat to see one. Um, probably count on my one hand the number of times I have seen one, but uh, it's pretty pretty much uh, a rare bird, but getting better. Lake St. Clair Metro Park. One of my favorites. Not far. Not far. But in that in that flyway. Exactly. Here, tell them about this. Well, this is uh, from the boardwalk that goes through the marsh at, uh, at the park there. And uh, this is a marsh wren. And as you can see, he's sitting on top of one of the uh, open cattails from last season. They usually come in pretty early in the spring. And again, this is a bird that has a really distinctive call. Rather bubbly call. And like most wrens, it has that same habit of, you know, perking their tail straight up from their uh, abdomen there. Yeah, kind of a common wren behavior. But if you want to see one of these, Lake St. Clair Metro Park is a good place. To say that after you shot this one, we went back out there and we saw these again. Yep. This is the uh, this is the western shore of Lake Erie. Several good places and not far from here again. Sterling State Park. Um, that's you know down near Monroe. We've got Point Millet Gate, uh, State Game Area and Erie Metro Park. All of those, uh, you need a, a Metro Park pass to go to the, any of the Metro Parks. But again, it's a very, very good place for birding. Yeah, you can pick up three good birding spots here within 20 minute, 25 minute drive of each other. And, you know, almost make a weekend of hitting these spots. And they're really good spots, both spring and fall. As a matter of fact, um, right down around uh, Lake Erie Metro Park and a little further south towards Point Lea in this fall, I have seen huge flocks of monarch butterflies uh, spending time overnight as they gather together on their way south in the fall. So you can see not only birds, but other great migrations going on at the same time. Yeah, and here's a great egret shot at Sterling State Park. We're about two years ago now, I think. Yep. Now we don't want to overlook your own your own home. Uh, you know where you live. Just get out and and walk around the neighborhood or walk around your house, because a lot of the birds that I'm going to show you next were shot in either our yards or friends' yards. Um, start with these uh, house finches. That a lot right now because they're, they're in nesting season now. And those are two male, actually three male uh, house finches. But if you also look closely in the lower part of the picture, there is a pine siskin. And uh, this was right out back. Now, I, our house kind of backs up to a little marsh area. And uh, this is a, a warbler that really likes marshes. The Peterson guide would say, witchety, witchety, witchety. And he's actually pretty common. Most places around here, if you're out near cattails or whatever, you're going to hear these guys. This is a common yellow throat is the name of the bird. Kind of that black mask, real distinctive look. Another pretty common one, and I saw one out back here uh, yesterday. Um, let's listen to him. Also one of the first warblers back. Yes. And this is a yellow warbler. And they do nest around here. Yeah. They, you know, as opposed to some of the other ones that move further north for nesting, yellow warblers, yellow throats, they all nest in this region. I was walking, uh, my neighbor's house backs up to, ours is kind of more marshy, but where his house is, it's a kind of woodsy. And I was kind of, you know, looking for birds over by his side of the property and saw this wood duck in a tree. You don't normally see ducks in a tree, but a wood duck, 
you can. <laughs> Where we used to live also backed up to a pond, and uh, this was late March. A lot of you know what these are. Let's listen to them. They'll walk around your neighborhood. We get them walking around the neighborhood, across the lawns. Of course, these are sandhill cranes. Oops. All right. Kind of changed it too quickly that I wanted the name of the bird to be on the slide. These have become quite common in the metro parks uh, to the point like out at Kensington Metro Park, they'll come and walk right up to you. So it's, it's just pretty spectacular birds, but then again, you want to have a healthy respect for them and keep your distance, but they're always looking for a free hand on it. This was, uh, we were visiting a friend up north, and of course, th th this is a common bird around here. Let's listen to its call. This was uh, kind of during a snowstorm, and I was, we were visiting friends up north in Bel Air, and this, this is a white-breasted nuthatch. He's climbing down his tree. That, that's one thing about nuthatches, and we talked about behavior. Um, and identifying the bird. This is a bird that will go head first down the tree trunk. And, you know, no other birds can do that. Your backyard. Yeah, this was a guy that came through in the spring a couple of years ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had a pair on the feeder on Valentine's Day this year. Haven't seen them since, but this is an eastern bluebird. And, you know, so, Listen to its call? Yeah, let's see. And these guys are around here pretty much most of the year. Um, if they've got food and uh, enough shelter, uh, they start breeding in late February and, you know, are highly attractive to nesting boxes that are built just for the purpose of these birds. And another bird that's made a tremendous comeback in the last 40 years. And you can look at the structure of this bird and uh, it's not too hard to imagine that it's in the same group of birds as our robins are. Exactly. They're, they're called thrushes. And this is a bird you'll hear all the time around your house. Let's listen to the call. Tufted titmouse. Peter, Peter. Now this, this we have a, uh, it's called a cranberry viburnum. Um, it uh, bears these berries that you can see in the lower part of the slide here. And uh, last year in 2021, and then again in this year, we got visited by flocks of dozens of these birds, stripping these berries from, from the, uh, Cranberry viburnum. Here's the sound. These are very weak call. You got to kind of listen close. I took these out my kitchen window. <laughs> Cedar wax wing. And of course, if you look at the wing, it looks like it's been dipped in wax, that red part of the wing right there. like the old ceiling wax they used to put on envelopes. Yeah. Another interesting thing here, Rick, is the fact that, you know, you've got plantings around the yard that are attracting birds like that. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's another thing that you can do to get birds into your yard is look for shrubs and trees that bear food that the birds will like. Now, this is a bird that, while not coming to your feeder for seed, he may come to your feeder for a meal. And this is a Cooper's hawk. I don't have the sound bite for this guy, but he landed uh, right on our deck. Uh, this was just about, I don't know, maybe a month ago now. Maybe uh, early March, I say. So a little, six weeks, seven weeks ago. 
But he landed there looking for um, a, a bird. This They are in a group of hawks called excipiters, and they primarily feed on small birds. So he's a bird feeder. <laughs> yes, that's, yes, he is. We have two levels of feeding going on at our bird feeding station. And, you know, it's funny. There weren't any other birds around when this guy was there. They, they all took off. And of course, if you're camping or you know anything like that, you always want to have your birding stuff with you. Um, this, of course, is a oriole, and they are they will love nectar um, as, along with the hummingbirds. But this was a hummingbird feeder, and this guy was trying to figure out how he could get the nectar out of this feeder. He was doing a lot of unusual acrobatics. Yeah. So. Yeah, you got to talk about this. Why do we see birds that aren't supposed to be here at all? Right. So our next few slides are some, what might be considered what some people might call accidentals, which means they're out of their range. And uh, this was near Taos, but this is a painted bunting. Now you've probably heard of indigo buntings in Michigan, but a painted bunting has got green and red and uh, blue but look at its range. Here's the range map. Um, you know, nowhere near Michigan. Wow. So to see one at Taos was a was a special treat. Wow. Now you wonder how we find these birds. There's an app that you can get called eBird, and it will tell you uh, birds that are being sighted in your area. This is another one that uh, came into Michigan a couple of years ago. Um, got caught up in one of those big late winter storms that kind of blew out or blew in from way up north. And this guy's an ivory gull, normally found up around the Arctic Circle. And you can see from the range map, he didn't belong here at all. This guy created quite a stir and uh, he was in the Flint River up by the U of M campus there. And Linda and I decided to get in the car that day and go up and take a look at him. Unfortunately, he was so far out of range that the uh, food that he was trying to feed on in the river and everything else was not sustainable for him. And he did pass away a couple of days later. But it was a very rare opportunity to see a very rare bird from Michigan. Well, here's another one. This one was taken not too far from Lake St. Clair Metro Park. And this is a mountain bluebird. And normally they're not found uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. Whoops, so, let me back up. It's okay. There, and, uh, there you can see the range right there. Probably the Black Hills of uh, South Dakota is about as far east as they come. And this guy, I think I shot this uh, sometime in January. This was several years ago. So again, we, we kind of call these accidentals. Here's another accidental that you shot. Yep. Uh, this Vic is really good at tracking these birds down. A lot of these are his shots, these accidentals here. Well, you know, when I see him show up on eBird, I'm thinking, okay, it's a good way to add another bird to my life list. But this little gal here, her name is Lily. And I don't know if you can tell from the photo, but on her right leg, uh, just above that horizontal branch, you can see the colors green and red there. She's wearing a band that's been put on there. Uh, probably by the National Wildlife Service. And this girl keeps coming back to Michigan now for the last five or six seasons. She builds a nest, but so far she hasn't been able to attract a male to come with her and nest here. And there is a group of these whooping cranes that have made it into Wisconsin and they are breeding there. But again, like Rick was talking about with the Kirtland Warbler, uh, this bird was extremely endangered, and I think we were down to less than 300 pairs in the wild back in the 70s. This was a bird that suffered real badly from, uh, you know, problems with DDT and overhunting. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, well, you know, we talked about the unusual birds, but now I'm going to talk about a common bird with what I consider to be an unusual behavior. And we have an American robin that has been eating seed continuously at my feeder, like all day. Like he'll just, I don't know if he even eats worms, he just comes to my feeder and eats seed. 
And I think this is kind of unusual. Maybe some of you have, have had this at your feeder, but they're generally not considered feeder birds. If, I've got a little video on the right here. He's on the platform there. I've got a little platform down at deck level and I spilled a little seed there and he's just eating all that seed. Don't you understand, Rick? He's a vegan. <laughs> Never saw that before. So speaking of feeding, now we're going to kind of go through a little bit of feeding, um, some information on feeding birds. And, and we'll talk about some different types of feeders as well. This is a hopper style feeder. You can open the top and spill the seed in. And um, the perch is, um, it's, it's hinged. So if a squirrel gets on the perch, that little door that you see just above these birds' heads here will close off. And the idea is that the squirrel can't get to that food. Now, you know, sometimes they're billed as squirrel proof. I don't know if there is such a thing as a squirrel proof feeder. Squirrels are pretty good at, uh, you know, cracking the code at just about anything. Now, here's a hopper feeder that you had in your yard. And you can talk about those birds on the left. Well, uh, the birds on the left, if you take a look at them, uh, those are, that is a pair of purple finches. And we talked earlier about house finches and they look similar. And you can see a picture of a house finch here on the right by the blood orange. But generally the purple finches are much more of a deep red, almost raspberry color. And you don't see that with the house finch. And I just got lucky one day and looked outside. It was during migration season. And I think somewhere I used to have a picture of a purple finch and a house finch kind of side by side. But these are the kind of guys you're gonna see right around this time of year coming through. Yeah, or, or, or late winter. Uh, yeah. Purple finches uh, used to be more common here many, many years ago. House finches were not a Michigan bird uh, 45 years ago no. or 50 years ago. Uh, they, they came into Michigan in the mid 1970s um, and then they kind of took over the niche of the purple finch, more or less. So the purple finches are much less common. A sure way to tell, though, is if you look at the wing on the purple finch on the left, you'll see the wing bars are also that kind of a raspberry color. House finches will always have kind of a white wing bar, even though you might see some house finches much more red than others. Uh, they have more, they don't have coloring on the wing bars like that bird on the left does, and it's a house finch. Another hopper style feeder. You can get these in all, all different uh, styles. This one's got a little tray underneath it, the cardinal on it. These are feeders especially designed for um, Niger seed, sometimes called thistle seed. They're technically not, they're, they look like thistle seeds that we might have from our wild thistles. In Michigan, they're about that size, but they're actually a, a different plant. But, um, the feeders for, for this type of seed have very small holes, so the birds can only get, you know, one or two of these seeds out at a time, even though the seeds are small. Now, those birds on the left, I had a winter before this one, and those are common red poles. They are some, they're visitors from the far north. We don't get them every year, but in, in years when food is more scarce uh, in northern Canada, they'll kind of wander south as an eruption, they call it. But one of the favorite, uh, one of the birds that really likes uh, this Niger seed is goldfinches, which you'll see one on the right there within uh, uh, nuptial. That's the goldfinch sound right there. <laughs> American goldfinch. And now they're finally looking like that. All winter long, they're kind of a drab olive green like the females. Some feeders are designed to uh, keep squirrels out and this like small birds like this chickadee. And so here's a tube feeder with some sunflower in it with a little cage around it to keep the squirrels out. Suet, um, very good way to attract woodpeckers. Woodpeckers love suet. This happens to be a shot with both a hairy woodpecker on the left and a downy woodpecker on the right. Now the hairy woodpecker you don't always see them next to each other to, to get the size reference. The downy is smaller. If 
But the better way to identify it is by the bill size in reference to its head. A hairy woodpecker will have a bill as long as its head, and the downy woodpecker will have a bill shorter than its head. And these are on, a, you know, these are, this is a suet feeder with raw beef suet. You have to go to Myers like the meat department. <laughs> That's the hairy woodpecker. The males have that red spot. And there's the uh, downy woodpecker. And that's a female because she doesn't have the red spot. Both these woodpeckers look alike except for the size. Here's one of my favorites. Uh, I didn't have one at my feeder all winter. He's again on a feeder with some raw suet here. I love the sound these birds make. Red breasted nut hatch. We didn't have one all winter, and uh, I was not far from here, about a half a mile from here, and I heard one. I'm like, oh, he won't come to my feeder. <laughs> This is a tufted titmouse on a, uh, a suet feeder again, this time with a suet uh, seed cake. Now you can get these seed cakes if you have a problem with squirrels also trying to get to the seed cakes, is they're after the seed. Uh, you can get seed cakes that are kind of treated with uh, cayenne pepper, doesn't seem to bother the birds. Um, squirrels don't particularly go for it, but if they're hungry enough, they will, <laughs> they'll still eat it. This is also, this is a commercially purchased suet uh, cake without seed. It's a plain, pure suet cake. Squirrels won't be attracted to it because there's no seed in it. Um, I think I got this at Defos in uh, Oxford. So here's some different types of seed that you can get. The striped sunflower uh, in the upper left, and then the black oiler sunflower in the upper right. Um, both of those are great. Uh, the, the Oilers, um, just really a lot of different birds love that seed. You really get a lot of birds. Uh, lower left is some safflower seed. You can buy it by itself, cardinals like that. Um, but the Oilers and the striped sunflower, those are going to be probably the favorites of more birds. In the middle on the bottom is the Niger seed, or the sometimes called thistle seed, as we said, the smaller seeds. In the middle on the top is a, a mixed feed that has oilers, safflower, a little bit of cracked corn, a pretty good mixture of uh, uh, mixed feed. What you want to avoid is um, seed with a lot of filler. And by filler, I mean like the milo and millet seed that you see in the lower right. House sparrows, they'll eat that stuff, but a lot of birds won't eat those as much as they'll eat all of these other types of seeds. So they're pretty cheap. Seed manufacturers will put them in the bag as a filler so they can get you know, your, your 20 pound bag. And I was kind of disappointed. I was, uh, Costco had a real good mixture of uh, bird feed, uh, real good quality. Um, and I was there the other day and I looked at one of their bags and it had quite a bit of millet in it. So I'm like, ah. Don't buy it. It cheapened out. Uh, here's some seed I got at Menards. Uh, these are sunflower kernels without the husks. It's a no mess. You won't be shoveling or vacuuming up uh, all the uh, sunflower husks in the springtime when you're done feeding. And a 20 pound bag is about 30 bucks if you get the 11% off, <laughs> maybe 33 bucks, 32.95, something like that. And that sounds pricey, but a, a, a 20 pound bag of this type of food has the nutritional equivalent of 70 pounds of oilers. And um, it's, so, good you know, it's actually not a bad buy. Let's talk about uh, the nectar feeders. Hummingbirds, that's a ruby. We have one species that's common here east of the Mississippi, and that's the ruby throated hummingbird. Um, the female on the bottom there, and the male on a feeder on the left. 
What you want to do to attract hummingbirds is mix a solution of one part sugar to four parts water. What I do is I, I take two cups of sugar and eight cups of water and I boil it to get it. When you do that, it kind of helps preserve it a little bit. It's, it's killing anything that might be in the water. It just helps preserve, makes it last a little longer. And then I, I put it in a, in a container, I keep it in the refrigerator and I use that for feeder changes until it's about done. But so it'll last a little bit longer in the refrigerator that way. But these, you gotta keep them clean every two, three, four days, depending on the weather. If it's warmer out, you wanna change them more often. Other nectar feeders are Orioles. And they're arriving right now. You had some yesterday, Vic? Yes. I haven't had one yet, but I know um, some friends of ours that live only about a mile away from here also had them yesterday. So I'm expecting them any day now. Now you can put sliced oranges out for these birds. These are all males in this picture, in these two shots. And of course they love jelly, grape jelly as well. Baltimore Oreo. Um, there are other species. If you put out grape jelly and oranges, you'll get some other birds. Now, this bird on the left, let's listen to him first. Look at that heavy bill. That's a seed-eating bird. Rose-breasted grosbeak. And I actually don't get many of these to my feeder. My particular feeder setup or yard, for whatever reason, I don't get very many of these. But this was a, a, a young guy, I think a not, not fully mature plumage yet. Um, and he was after the grape jelly. <laughs> and uh, the red-bellied woodpecker that you see on the right also just loves that, uh, they love oranges in particular. You wanna place your feeders near good cover so the birds can fly and not, not have too far to go to escape, but you also want to place them where you can see them from the house. This is actually a shot out my <laughs> out my bedroom window. Is my whole feeder set up right there? So I mean, what's the point if you can't see them from the house? And a bird bath. Uh, we have one that uh, plugs in in the winter time, keeps it from freezing up. This is a pine siskin very close relative of the goldfinch that we showed earlier. Let's listen to it. I've had a pair of those coming to my feeder now for about a month and a half. When I get up to go to work in the morning, they're up there making that noise. And you can see it's a pretty drab bird, but they have a tinge of yellow there on the, you know, their primaries and uh, outer tail feathers. This is a quiz, folks. Hope you're ready for a quiz. Okay. Who's got the answer? It's a common bird. And you can... Probably in your backyard. There it is. There you go. Northern Carp. Not this guy. You don't have a live mic. You can text in your answer, message your answer. But this is, this is the goldfinch. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> of course. It's our state bird. And about 20 to 25% of them will stay around all winter. They can find food, they'll eat berries and they'll eat, apparently they're eating seed now too. But uh, here's our last one.
Both of those are the same bird. That's the call. You used to think it was saying cheeseburger. <laughs> and the other one is chickadee dee dee. Yep. Maybe Thank you, everybody. Questions? We're ready for questions. Okay, uh, we've got one question. I'd like to buy some seed, but I could use a one pager that lets me know what type of seed would procure certain types of birds. Do you know a resource like that? So are there particular birds? I mean, I, I, I would say the widest variety of birds is gonna be the, like those black oiler sunflowers. Yeah, sunflower yeah. seeds or, or a good no mess blend that has sunflower kernels and peanuts in it. Okay, so if you want, you know, like a cardinal, I think the person wants to know if you want a cardinal, what kind of seed would you use if you have a, a you know, the woodpecker? Well, they don't seed, but um, well, they, they, they do, woodpeckers, do they? yeah. So, that's just, is there any kind of resource that you know of? Maybe that's something you could do the next time. Is Okay, a certain bird likes certain right. seed. Right, and when you, if you go to some place where they have a pretty good selection of feed uh, and seed, um, you can, you, a lot of the manufacturers are putting right on the bags the type of birds that'll eat that seed. So you can look at the, you know, the back of a, I don't know, a bag of oilers from KT, for example, and it'll tell you all the birds that, you know, uh, are attracted to that particular type of seed. Maggie? I yeah. know that at the Troy Library that you're going to have books there. Uh, there's like field guides to uh, backyard bird feeding. Mm -hmm. And those field guides or those backyard reference books will tell you exactly what kind of seeds or feed to use to attract certain birds. That's, that's true. And we have those for checkout. You do. Okay, I got another question. In 1999 at our a cottage in Bel Air, we had lots of swallows. Every year we had less and less, now they are gone. Why? Then two years we had an abundance of American red stars. Now they aren't any. Why? Also, they say not to feed the birds because the bird flu. So yeah, there's another question about bird flu also. Yeah, we're gonna, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the bird flu here. Um, I'm gonna get to that. I actually have a series of slides Following this question slide, because I anticipated that you, you folks would want to know a little bit about the bird flu. But back to that question. Um, uh, so are you pretty sure they're swallows? They may have been martins, uh, where maybe their nesting house was taken over by something else, like house sparrows. Or perhaps, um, well, so I mean, that's what happened to me. I had martins in my yard, and the... Uh, the Martin house, some of the holes got taken over and the Martins just abandoned the, the house. But now if there's swallows, um, I'm not sure. There could be a number of things going on. I mean, if there's some habitat loss near the cottage, you know, uh, that could affect bird populations. But um, swallows, to my knowledge, aren't declining. I, I think that's a bird that's doing fine. Most of, all those, most of the common swallows we see anyway, like tree swallows or barn swallows. And okay. the other bird was uh, what Red else? Start. Red They've Red. seen them for a while and now they're not here. And as far as I know, those populations are okay. But again, if there's some habitat alterations nearby, that could possibly affect it. Okay. Um, I know you're going to talk about the bird flu, but let's finish some of these questions uh, and mm -hmm. then we'll go into that. Um, Somebody wants to know, which free apps do you recommend? I think the best one going out there, and you can see if you agree, Vic, uh, the Merlin Bird ID. Very good. Uh, it's, uh, it's, from, it's put out by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, and it's free. Uh, and it's, it's even got a feature where you can, you know, record a bird sound and, and get it ID. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good app. Um, called Merlin Bird ID. It'll be in the handout. Uh, another question is how to attract birds to the bird houses? Keep them cleaned out for each season. 
because sometimes if there's a nest from the previous season, uh, for whatever reason, certain birds won't go in there. So you know, at the, most of the bird houses are gonna have a, a door that you can unscrew or somehow access to clean them out at the end of the season. I think that's the best way. And then of course, placement for whatever bird you're trying to attract, you wanna to try to get them kind of at the right height. Um, you know, like if you're trying to attract wrens, wrens will go anywhere from about five feet to maybe, I don't know, maybe eight feet up or something like that, maybe a little higher. But, um, you know, too low or too high might discourage certain birds from nesting. So depending on the type of bird you're trying to attract, you can kind of look up, uh, you know, you can get on, the, on Google and do a search best birdhouse placement for the type of bird that you're trying to attract. And also, and also birdhouses have certain holes for different birds? Yes. So or, if you're, yeah, well, well, so, you know, if you want something like a wren and you don't want a house sparrow, house sparrows will go into cavities, you know, if you inch, inch, if you got something like an inch, inch and a half, or even an inch and a quarter, you might get house sparrows. But if you got like an inch and an eighth, that's going to limit it. House sparrows won't go in there. Um, wrens will. Okay, another question. Is there an easy way to clean a feeder? Mm. It depends on the type of feeder that you're using. Yeah, uh, some feeders have a, a quick release bottom to them that allows you to, to, but in terms of thoroughly cleaning it, like they'll tell you on the, uh, we're going to talk about the bird flu in a minute and keep keeping feeders clean, but they'll tell you to use like a, a diluted mild bleach solution, but then you, you know, you're without, you're without feed for a day because you're gonna let it dry. Um, you know, you gotta get a brush that goes in there uh, if you're really doing a thorough job of it. But some feeders do have quick access where you don't have to unscrew the whole feeder and allows you to better do that. Okay, one more question be, uh, and before we talk about the bird flu. Um, where's a good place to see uh, bald eagles? Oh, I got that one for you. Uh, that golden triangle we talked about down river. Uh, if you want to see bald eagles, go to uh, Sterling State Park. It's not too far from the Detroit Edison plant there right on Lake Erie. And they're flying around all the time there. Okay. All right, you're going to get into the bird flu now. All right, so if you're not familiar with uh, the bird flu, avian flu, this is a highly pathogenic virus affecting primarily domestic poultry, such as chickens, also turkeys, pheasants, quails, ducks, geese, and swans, and also predatory and scavenging birds, um, such as like hawks and uh, even blue jays and crows, which are scavenging type of birds. So those are the birds that are most susceptible. Um, most of the songbirds are thought not to be as affected, but they still could potentially um, be spreaders. So uh, bird baths also where they're sharing water. Um, a, a lot of this information that I'm, I'm telling you about, I have a source listed on the handout. Um, it is the department, uh, is a michigan.gov website, um, Department of Agriculture, and I think it's Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Um, and that is a website that's been keeping track of the avian flu. Now, I went on that website today and I did not see Oakland County on their, on their list yet. So we're still feeding birds. The DNR has recommended temporary removal of feeders and bird baths in affected areas. So you can go to the website that's at the bottom of the handout that we're, um, it's gonna be you know, on, the, on the website, library website. Um, and there's a resource on the bottom of how to get to that website. Again, um, that handout is where you registered on the calendar under May 3rd. It's on the right side of the screen and you can download it. And it just says, get out and bird. And uh, so that's where that's located. Now they recommended it. This is not a mandate, um, but if, if you're, let's say, let me go to the next slide here. Um, um, let me come back to this slide. It, I'm going to just say, if your um, feeder is near, well, you want to keep your feeders clean. So they're recommending keeping your feeders, seed feeders you know, cleaned up once a week. 
And, um, but also, you know, if you're near, um, like, let's say a neighbor is raising chickens or something like that. Well, that's more of a reason, I think, to, to, uh, you know, adhere to, you know, to adhere to these uh, guidelines. Now, um, just, just an opinion here. I think your nectar feeding birds uh, and jelly feeding birds aren't going to mix as much with some of the other birds. Like, you know, when you have, when you're feeding seed, like uh, sunflower seed, you get like eight or 10 species um, share in the feeder. And um, your jelly feeders or nectar feeding birds, especially hummingbirds, they're pretty much going to the feeder on their own. Um, and so they're probably not as likely, in my opinion anyway, to, to, to spread it. Do the birds show any obvious signs of infection uh, or do they, do, you know, like a general malaise or do they just... Yeah, there'll be, there'll be some malaise. There'll be, uh, in fact, the website that I'm going to share with you does does um, talk about some symptoms. I mean, they, yeah, pretty, pretty lethargic, I think is the most obvious thing that you might see. Well, I, I had a pine siskin last week that just stayed on the feeder and really didn't move at all and almost got mobbed by a couple of uh, morning doves. And I thought perhaps maybe he was sick with something. And there's other diseases that can be affecting. Um, there's like for the house finches, there's, a, there's kind of an eye disease that they can get. So it is a, a reason to try to keep your feeders clean. Um, so the risk to humans is low. But I do want to mention that it is possible for humans to get this disease. Uh, but mostly this is going to happen with people that are like actually, you know, readily working with, with poultry, you know, uh, like live chickens. Um, a lot of these things like, in, you know, originate like over in like China and that where they do, it's maybe a little more common that people work with poultry, um, you know, like not people like maybe in the poultry uh, business so much as just people, people, more, more people do it individually. But um, so, you know, some precautions, you know, if you're working closely with birds like that, and you're doing, you know, working closely with poultry, uh, you know, then maybe you probably would wear a mask, <laughs> you know, and working, working with these birds, because it is possible for people to contract the disease. It's not something that goes from human to human on an airborne type of thing, at least not I mean, could there be a mutation in the future? I suppose, but it's not happening at this point. So that, um, yeah, that's, uh, we very much appreciate it. Are there any other questions? Did you want to show that handout now? Yeah, let me see if I can do that. I mean, uh, hold on a second here. So the handout is going to look like this. Are you seeing the handout now? Yeah. Uh -huh. So we listed some hard copy identification field guides, which very few people are using now that there's all these um, smartphone apps. But you can get some of these pretty reasonable uh, off of Amazon still. And if you like to carry a hard copy field guide with you, one of the advantages is that you can kind of open a page and see a lot of different birds at the same time to compare them. So that's still a nice thing in terms of a hard copy field guide. Um, I'll say that the, the Robbins field guide, the birds of North America, the first one listed there, is an older edition. It'll have some older names for some of the birds. It's only 10 bucks, but it's a, still a field guide that's made on the original size that people can put in their pocket. Some of the other field guides have gone to a larger format because people are more using them for reference now than they are carrying them in the field. The, the smartphone apps, we talked about the Merlin app. Uh, that's the third one listed in the middle here, put out by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. And that one's free, very good one. There's also a real good Audubon field guide app that's free. iBird Pro is about 15 bucks last I looked today. And the Sibley guide is also on there. That's about 20 bucks. Um, a person asks, what about... Um suet and bird flu? Um, again, if you're getting, I mean, if, if it comes up like we're going to have this, and if, if you see it in Oakland, I'm, this website on the bottom of this handout, very bottom here, 
uh, Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Um, if you go to that website, and there's a link right here. Um, they'll talk about, uh, you know, the bird flu in more detail than, than, than we've talked about tonight. But um, it depends on, uh, you know, if you, if you see a lot of species using it, including like blue jays and that, which are scavengers, and they've announced bird flu in Oakland County, um, then I'd say no on the sewage. Want to click on that link so they can see it? Will it go into that for you? It might. I might have to do a different screen share. Let's see what happens here. Uh, let's see here. How about now? Are you guys? Yep. Uh -huh. There it is. Seeing it? Okay. So again, for um, it is on the bottom of that handout. And again, the handout is on our website under the calendar. So um, feel free and it, it, they keep it up to date. So I'd be watching that and- um, You can actually sign up right here. I don't know if you can see my cursor going around, but right here you can sign up to receive an email update about uh, the avian. Uh, and every time they discover a new county, you would get an update. Now it says it's uh, what, Kalamazoo, Branch County, Livingston, Macomb, uh, Menominee, Saginaw, Washtenaw and Wexford, but not Oakland yet. So, so are you just putting right now your um, um, hummingbird feeder and your um, Oreo? Well, I mean, I'm still feeding uh, a little bit of seed just because I did take my bird bath down temporarily, but I, I'm still feeding some seed in that because it's not in Oakland County yet that I've seen. So if, it come, if they announce it in Oakland County, I'll take it, probably just um, feed the nectar hummingbird stuff and maybe a little bit for the Orioles. Okay, let's see if there's any other questions. We talked about the apps. Um, said thank you, enjoyed the bird songs and images. Um, and I think that's it. And again, um, I thought that uh, was a great presentation. And um, again, um, when you leave this presentation, you will see a, a survey. If you could fill that out, we would really appreciate it. And uh, thanks again, everyone. And uh, have a great night and enjoy uh, spring and the birds. Thank you, everybody, for being uh, in. And get out there and go birding. Exactly. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.